Of late, we have received a lot of requests to create videos on highly relevant topic, the most important questions which can be asked in the investment banking job interview. To address this, we have analyzed thousands of questions our students have been asked in their job interview over the past few years. In this video, we have compiled selection of those questions along with brief suggested answers in a structured manner. So let's start with the part one on the investment banking interview questions. Question number one, can you explain difference between equity value and enterprise value? Friends, equity value is the value applicable to the shareholders of the company. It is one of the source of capital employed in the business. Whereas enterprise value represents the value of entire business. It includes all the sources of capital employed in the business, including debt as well as equity. So we can say enterprise value is more comprehensive measure of value than the equity value as it looks at all the components of capital employed in the business. Whereas equity value is looking at just one component of uh, total value, which is the owner's equity. Now we can put this enterprise value into following equation. So enterprise value is equal to market cap. So market cap is what? It's a market value of total equity of the company, which is calculated as diluted shares outstanding multiplied by current market price plus non-controlling interest plus preference stock plus total debt. So total debt includes short term debt, long term debt, debentures, bonds, senior notes and any other kind of debt interest bearing liability what company has borrowed minus cash and cash equivalents. Friends total debt minus cash and cash equivalent is also known as net debt. Now let's move to the next question. Question number two. How do we value a company? So here we need to explain different different methods of valuation of a company. So we can put these methods into two categories relative valuation and intrinsic valuation. Under relative valuation, again, we have two methods, comparable public companies analysis and precedent transactions. Whereas under DCF intrinsic valuation, we have DCF analysis. Now friends, let's understand basic difference between these three methods of valuation. Comparable public company analysis, it calculates implied value of the company based on how other similar type of companies are priced in the equity market. So here we compare market prices of same type of companies which are already priced in the market. Now under transaction costs, which is precedent transactions, we calculate implied value of company based on how similar type of companies were priced in the past MA transactions. So here we calculate value of the company based on past MA deals. And the basic difference between public company analysis and precedent transaction is under public company analysis, we compare the market prices, whereas under precedent transactions, we compare the MA prices. Now let's move to the third technique. DCF valuation. Under DCF valuation, we calculate implied value of the company based on its projected cash flows discounted to the present value. So here we first need to project future cash flows of the business and then we need to discount those cash flows to the present value. So friends, this is how we can explain different different methods of valuation of the company. Question number three, what is DCF valuation? and brief the process. So here you need to explain DCF valuation method and step by step approach of DCF. Under DCF valuation, the valuation is done based on projected cash flows of the business. We can break down this DCF valuation into following key steps. So step one, deciding about high growth phase. Friends, we first need to decide high growth phase of the business before this business will get mature. We normally assume this high growth phase 5 to 10 years. Assuming that during this phase, the growth of the business will reach to the maturity stage. Now, once you have decided high growth phase of the business, you have to move to the step two. And the step two is what? Project free cash flows of the business for high growth phase. So in step two, you have to project cash flows of the business, free cash flows of the business for high growth phase, which you have decided in step one. Step three, 
calculate discount rate discount rate applicable for the business which can be WACC weighted average cost of capital or KE cost of equity depending upon which cash flows we are discounting. So if you are discounting free cash flows to the firm discount rate would be WACC VAC and if you are discounting free cash flows to the equity my discount rate would be cost of equity. Step 4 calculation of terminal value of the business. Friends, once we are done with the high growth phase, projection of uh, free cash flows for high growth phase, we have to calculate terminal value of the business. This value represents the value of the business for the remaining life. So if you have done projection for five years, this terminal value represents the value of the cash flow for six to infinite period. Okay. Friends, we can calculate terminal value using one of these two methods, perpetual growth method and exit multiple method. Step five, discounting projected cash flows and terminal value using the discount rate calculated in step 3. So friends here we need to find present value of future cash flows and terminal value. Step 6 DCF value. So DCF value is what? It's a sum of present value of projected cash flows and the present value of terminal value. So friends under step 2 we projected free cash flows for the high growth phase. And under step 4, we calculated terminal value, which represents the value of the business for remaining life. Now, in the last step, we find the present value of both these cash flows. Your projected free cash flows and terminal value. And if we sum up both, we will get the DCF value of the business. Now, let's move to the question number 4. Question number 4. What is difference between DCF valuation and trading comps based valuation method? Friends, here you need to explain basic difference between these two methods of valuation. DCF valuation. So under DCF valuation method, valuation is done on the basis of cash flows projected by the analyst based on his or her assumption about the future of the business. So how the business will grow in the future that will decide your DCF valuation. Whereas under trading comps, valuation is based on how Market is pricing similar type of companies in the market. So friends, in DCF valuation, the DCF valuation is based on your view about the future of the company. Whereas under trading comps, the valuation is based on market view about the future of the company. Okay. Bankers use DCF valuation to check the valuation they are getting under relative valuation techniques which might be distorted by the existing abnormal and extreme situations in the market. So friends, banker can use both the methods together to understand if they are getting fair valuation or a reasonable valuation under trading comps. So if there are extreme situations in the market, your trading comps based valuation may be affected by that. But in that case, DCA valuation will help you to understand what's the reason behind this distortion. Now let's move to the next question. Question number five. How you calculate free cash flows to the firm? So here you need to explain process of calculation of free cash flows to the firm required for DCF valuation. So free cash flows to the firm means cash flows available for distribution among all the stakeholders of the business after meeting its reinvestment requirement. Okay, so what surplus cash left with the business after making or after reinvesting required capital in the business? This is what we calculate under free cash flows to the firm. Friends, example of calculation of free cash flow is suppose you have earning before interest and taxes, which is earnings available to the firm, say thousand. Okay, from this earnings, you first have to pay taxes because it is earning before interest and taxes, right? So say tax rate is 30%. So total tax on EBIT is 300. So after paying taxes, you are left with the earnings to the firm after taxes, which is also called unlevered earnings 700. Now this 700 rupees or $700 is the earnings to the firm after paying taxes, but this is not cash flows. From this earnings, we have to make adjustments for the net reinvestment. So we first have to add back 
depreciation amortization expenses which is non cash expense say 100 so we have assumed here total dna expenses 100 which is deducted above ebit so we are adding back here then less capital expenditure so business might need to reinvest some part of the earnings in form of uh, capital expenditure buying long term assets say 350 then less working capital changes so business might need to invest some part of their earnings into working capital to fund its working capital requirement which is 150 so 700 plus 100 minus 350 minus 150 will give you free cash flows to the firm 300 okay and guys summation of these three component dna plus capital expand minus capital expenditure minus working capital changes this is called net reinvestment in the business so free cash flows to the firm means earning before interest and taxes minus taxes on earnings which will give you no pet plus dna expenses which is depreciation amortization minus capex minus working capital changes question number six how do we calculate free cash flows to the equity so in the previous question we calculated free cash flows to the firm here we will calculate free cash flows to the equity so friends to calculate fcfe we need to subtract claim of debt claim of debt from free cash flows to the firm as free cash flows to the firm belongs to all the sources of capital including debt so from the free cash flows to the firm if we subtract claim of the debt we will be left with the free cash flows to the equity so let's see how we can calculate this free cash flows to the equity with an example so in the previous example we had free cash flows to the firm 300 okay now from this free cash flows to the firm we first have to pay interest net of taxes on the debt so first payment will be done for interest expenses obviously you have to subtract tax shield on it which is assumed to be 50 then less debt repaid so if you are supposed to pay or make repayment of any debt there so you have to first subtract that amount add debt raised so if you are raising any fresh debt in the year you will add back this amount so basically minus 100 plus 20 this minus 80 represents net changes in the debt during the year 80 rupees or 80 dollar you would require to repay your debt net of debt raised 50 would be required for paying interest expenses to service your debt so net cash flows left for the equity is 170 300 minus 50 minus 80 okay so this free cash flow is available to the equity holders okay question number seven in dcf how you decide about projection period of a company so here we need to explain process of deciding about high growth phase of the business because in step one of dcf we first have to decide high growth phase of the business for which we have to do explicit projections okay projection period is dependent upon how long the business can sustain high growth rate before reaching to the matured growth phase so friends deciding about the high growth phase of the business is totally dependent upon nature of the business usp of the company current size of the company and the competition in the industry so if the nature of the business is such that the entry barriers are very strong we can assume this high growth phase for the extended period if the usp of the company is strong still we can assume the extended high growth phase if there is no usp then my growth phase high growth phase would be limited current size of the company that also plays a crucial role in deciding high growth phase of the business if the current size of the company is small then the company can sustain high growth rate for the extended period whereas large size companies cannot sustain high growth rate for the extended period because of the base effect competition in the industry so if the competition in the industry is very stiff the high growth rate cannot be sustained for the longer period but if the competition is very less then we can assume extended high growth phase for the company usually we consider high growth phase for the business in the range of 5 to 10 years assuming that during this phase the business is going to achieve, attain a maturity stage unless and until particular company has very strong usp and the large untapped market 
So in the normal scenario guys, my high growth phase or my projection period remain in the range of 5 to 10 years. Unless until company has very strong USP, it has very uh, you know unique product and also the market size is huge. Untapped market size is huge. Okay. Question number 8. In DCF, can you explain difference between year end discounting and mid year discounting? So friends, here we need to explain difference between two different methods of discounting of cash flows. Under year end discounting, we assume that all the cash flows in the business are happening at the end of the period. Whereas under mid year discounting, we are assuming that cash flows are happening consistently throughout the year. So friends, the basic difference between mid-year discounting and the year-end discounting is under mid-year discounting, we are assuming that cash flows are happening consistently throughout the year. So they are available for distribution throughout the year to the stakeholders. Whereas under year-end discounting, we are assuming that these cash flows are available for distribution just at the end of the period. Okay. So the time frame during which these cash flows are available for distribution is different. Under mid-year discounting, we pick the mid of the year as a discounting period to discount future cash flows of the business. Also, we get higher valuation under mid-year discounting compared to the year-end discounting due to reduction in the discounting period. So friends, we can understand this with an example here. Year-end discounting. So let's assume we have four fiscal year cash flows, year one, two, three and four. Now point of cash flows. So we are assuming that these cash flows, cash flows related to these years are happening at the end of the year, at the completion of the year. So here my discounting period would be what? One for the year one cash flows, two for the year two cash flows, three and four for the fourth year cash flows. Now friends, in case of media discounting, I'm assuming that these cash flows are happening throughout the year. So these cash flows will not happen just at the end of the year. They are happening throughout the year consistently. Okay. And here my discounting period would be what the midpoint of the year. I cannot assume zero here or I cannot assume one here because this, these cash flows are happening throughout the year. So I'll pick just midpoint of this year, just an average of between two zero and one. So my discounting period would be what? 0.5, 1.5, 2.5 and 3.5. So this is what basic difference between year end discounting and mid year discounting. And as you can see, I'm getting lesser discounting period in the mid year discounting. That's why the DC evaluation would be on the higher side. Question number nine, how will you project growth of the business, growth of the company? So here we need to discuss various factors we consider in deciding the future growth of the business in DC evaluation. Growth projection of the company is dependent upon various factors, including one, historical growth trend of the business, how the business is growing in the past. Two, future expansion plans of the business. For this, we can look into management commentary, transcript, etc. Expansion in the demand of existing customers. How the existing customers demand will grow in the future. Addition of the new customers. So along with the existing customers demand, what additional demand will come from the new customers we are going to add. Expected growth in the industry. And then current penetration rate in the industry. How the industry is currently penetrated. It, is it a saturated industry or under penetrated industry. We can apply one of two or both of following approaches to estimate future growth of the business. So method of projection is top down approach and second method is bottom up approach. Under top down approach, we decide about the industry size first and then we reach to the growth of the company. Under bottom up approach, we decide about the future of the company based on its growth drivers. Okay. Question number 10, what is top down approach of projection? Can you explain? So here we need to explain top down approach of projection. 
what we discussed in the last slide. The top-down approach. Under top-down approach, we first forecast industry and then the market share of our company in that industry. Okay, so here we start with the industry sizing and then we reach to the market share of our company. Step-by-step -step approach of top-down approach. Step one, forecast the industry size. So here we first need to estimate size of our total industry. So let's assume the industry size would be 100 units. That would be for the next year. Okay, so in the next year we are expecting in this industry the total unit to be sold would be 100. Okay, step two, we have to estimate share of our company, share that our company would be able to grab in the total industry size we have estimated in step one. So out of total 100 units but that would be sold in the industry, how many units will be sold by our company? So let's assume that our company share is going to be 20% of this total industry size. Friends, in deciding the company's market share, that would depend upon its available capacity. So it should have a capacity to produce these many units, future expansion plans of the company and competition in the market. That is also important. You know how many peers are already operating in the market and also your product differentiation, how unique your product is. So all these factors will decide what size of the market you will be able to grab. Step three, you have to estimate price of the product or services the company is offering. So let's assume the company is expecting to sell their unit, this is this 20% of the 100 units, say at a price of $100. That's the selling price of their uh, product, okay? Then the step four, Projected revenue of the company would be total industry size, which is 100 unit. Out of 100 unit, they will be able to grab 20%. My company will be able to grab 20%. So, we will be able to sell what? 20 units multiplied by product price. So, my product price is 100. So, total re expected revenue would be $2,000. So, friends, this is how we will estimate revenue of the company under top-down approach. So here we are starting from the top, from the industry sizing and we reach to the market share of the company. So friends, those are the top 10 questions that can be asked in an industry banking interview. We hope this video has been helpful to you. If you have any questions, feel free to comment below and we'll be happy to reach out to you. You can also reach out to us through our website www.thewallstreetschool.com. We'll be releasing part 2 soon. Until then, stay informed and stay tuned. Goodbye.